Planning Board to order. Do you want to have any additions or corrections to the minutes of the May 20th meeting? <coughs> Hearing none, do I hear a motion? So moved. There, moved is submitted. All in favor? Approved. Raise your right hand. Thank you. Uh, I believe Mr. Parkhurst will be here shortly and possibly Mr. Carlson here shortly, but we do have a quorum, so I think we should proceed. I'd like to read for the record the correspondence that has been received since the previous meeting. A letter from the town attorney regarding public access waivers. A letter from John Upton regarding the Beacon Lane public access waiver. Letter from the town attorney regarding the Beacon Lane public access waiver. Letter from Jay Harris regarding the Beacon Lane public access waiver. Letter from Cape Elizabeth Little League regarding the ball fields. Letter from Mr. and Mrs. Murray regarding the Hennessy site plan. Letter from Beacon Lane residents regarding the Beacon Lane public access waiver. A letter from Jay Harris regarding the Beacon Lane public access waiver. A memorandum from the police chief regarding the Beacon Lane public access waiver. A letter from R. Hamlin regarding Elizabeth Heights site plan. And a letter from the town attorney regarding the Lawton public access waiver. The first order of new business this evening is the Bluestone Quarry Earth Materials Permit. A request by Leland P. Murray and Sons for renewal of the earth materials permit for Bluestone Quarry located at 1019 Sawyer Road under section 19-8-5 earth materials removal standards public hearing. This is under the new zoning ordinance. So anybody from the applicant here this evening? If so, why don't you come forward and tell us why you're here, sir? Please identify yourself and Tell us who you are. My name is Jim Murray. I'm a president of L.P. Murray & Sons, requesting the annual permit for Bluestone Quarry located on Sawyer Road. Um, I have uh, walked the area, perimeter. The fence is intact all the way around. The signs are up. And to my knowledge, uh, there has been no complaints. Thank you. I guess I'd like to note that under our new ordinance, the application is a little more streamlined than it has been in the past. So let's uh, not uh, rely only on our former methodology, but on the new one. Um, any other comments that you wish to make, Mr. Murray? Or No. All right. Then why don't we open the public hearing and... I'll do so at this time. Anybody who wishes to speak with respect to this application, please come forward. Do note some people in the crowd, but uh, nobody making a uh, huge beeline for the podium. So seeing nobody uh, willing or interested in speaking at the public hearing, I will close the public hearing. Any comments from the, uh, any members of the board with respect to Bluestone Quarry? Note for the record that the uh, two areas that uh, Mr. Murray is interested in working on this year are well away from the perimeter and seem to be fairly well detailed in the materials that he submitted to us. Mary, would you point out to us for purposes of the board members and also the people who might be reviewing this uh, in front of their television sets just where the areas are that you're interested in working for the coming year? Okay. The areas here are marked in yellow. Okay. All lime green, whatever you want to call it. And they're two, <laughs> two, two separate areas, correct? Right, two separate areas. Mm hmm If there are no questions or comments from board members, do I hear a motion? Mr. Cotter. Motion for the board to consider. 
findings of facts. The applicant operates Bluestone Quarry located at 1019 Sawyer Road. The facility requires a special permit to remove earth materials under Section 19-8-5. The facility will conduct blasting and transport operations which could endanger the public health, safety, and welfare. The applicant has substantially addressed the earth material permit requirements in Section 19-8-5D. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Leland Murray for renewal of an earth materials permit at the Bluestone Quarry located at 1019 Sawyer Road be granted by the Planning Board for one year period beginning June 17, 1997 and ending with the regular June 1998 meeting of the Planning Board subject to the following conditions. The applicant shall maintain a fence at least three feet in height around the perimeter of the site. Number two, the applicant shall maintain comprehensive general public liability insurance with coverage not less than $500,000 per person and per occurrence for bodily injury or death and not less than $100,000 per occurrence for property damage. Number three, no operations shall be conducted at the quarry on Saturdays, Sundays, or holidays except that stone may be loaded and trucked from the site on Saturdays. No machinery or equipment shall be operated before 8 a.m. or after 6 p.m on any day except that loading of trucks shall only take place between 7.30 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. Number four, all blasting shall be performed by and under the direct personal supervision of a person qualified, experienced, and regularly engaged in, show, in such work and shall be done in a manner which will not endanger the health or safety of any person or damage any real or personal property on or off the quarry site. Representatives of the applicant shall be present at all time of the blasting operation. Number five, the applicant shall keep accurate records of any and all blasting operations, including times and dates of such operations, and information on size and placement of all charges. The schedule for any blasting and drilling shall be submitted by the applicant to the public safety dispatcher at least seven days prior to the commencement of the work. The schedule shall include the name of the drilling and or blasting subcontractor who will perform the work and a certificate of insurance for, some, for such subcontracting. Drilling and blasting shall be scheduled for no more than one half day at a time. Number six, the applicant shall make a reasonable effort to notify Cape Elizabeth residents along Sawyer Road and Stillman Street in the vicinity of the quarry prior to any blasting operations. Number seven, no more than 10,000 cubic yards of material shall be removed during the term of this permit. Number eight, if the code enforcement officer finds at any time that the health, safety, or welfare of every residence or property is threatened by quarry operations, he or she is authorized and directed to order that all work at the site be suspended immediately and to require that operations be resumed only after further action by the planning board. Thank you, Mr. Cotter. Do I hear a second to the motion? Second. Thank you, Mr. Emery. Any further discussion? All in favor of the motion, please raise your right hand. It's unanimous. Thank you very much, Mr. Murray. Thank Thanks you. For doing such a good job for the previous year. <laughs> the second order of business this evening is the Beacon Lane Public Access Waiver, a request by Lise Thibodeau and Kevin Zorsky for an amendment to a previously granted public access waiver located at Beacon Lane. Lot U15-66 under section 19-4-2B of the old zoning ordinance. Would a representative from the applicant like to come forward? Uh, good evening. My name is John Upton. I'm a lawyer uh, in Portland with Perkins Thompson, Hinckley, and Caddy, and I'm here on behalf of the applicants. Uh, uh, Kevin Zorsky and Elise Thibodeau. Elise Thibodeau is out in the audience tonight. I also have with me Tom Goral from DeLuca Hoffman. If your procedure permits, I'd like to make some introductory remarks and then uh, ask Tom to make a presentation and then, if I may, uh, be allowed to uh, return to the podium to, uh, to summarize our position. This is an unusual uh, application, Mr. Upton, and I think uh, your, your outlined procedure makes sense, so please proceed. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I, I'd like to take a moment to talk about what, what is coming before you tonight uh, and some of the policy aspects of it. I know there's some members of the public, uh, uh, neighbors in particular, who are concerned about uh, 
this concept of a public access waiver. And I want to be clear up front what uh, our client is trying to do in this process. Uh, we're seeking an amendment of uh, two conditions that were um, imposed by this board back in a 1990 order uh, allowing a public access waiver. Uh, I think it would be useful just to, to remind all of us what a public access waiver is intended to accomplish. Uh, our clients own a lot. They want to get a building permit. Their road uh, that, that they use for access is a private road, and therefore under the uh, ordinances that existed in 1990 and up until a few days ago, required a public access waiver in order for a building permit to be issued. So in that, in that light, we're looking for a public access waiver. The term, I think, raises some specter about uh, the possibility of taking away people's uh, uh, per personal property uh, rights in Beacon Lane, and that certainly is, is not uh, the intention of this application in any way or respect. We're simply trying to obtain the necessary prerequisites in order to, uh, to get a building permit so that our applicant, who, uh, uh, client who, is, who has owned this lot now for almost 10 years, could do something productive with it. And so I hope all of us can keep that in mind in the context of, of deliberations tonight. Uh, going back to the 1990 uh, order that was uh, issued by this board, um, uh, there were nine conditions at that time that were uh, imposed by the board uh, as uh, uh, preconditions to the, the right of our applicant uh, to get a building permit. Two of those conditions have proven uh, uh, extremely difficult to meet, and it's for that reason that we're here tonight. Uh, those conditions have to do with uh, a requirement uh, in subparagraph E of the order of 1990 that uh, a legally binding prohibition on blocking or parking be obtained from uh, the neighbors on Beacon Lane and C that we meet certain uh, site distance requirements at the intersection of uh, Two Lights Road and Beacon Lane. I'd like to take the legally binding prohibition first and speak briefly to that, uh, then go to site distance, and then ask Mr. Goral if he would make uh, a presentation in his capacity as a, a traffic engineer. On the legally binding prohibition, I, I think what I, I understood from going back and reviewing the minutes of the board uh, and, and reviewing the materials is there was a concern at the time that there were rocks in the road, uh, there was um, some difference of opinion in the neighborhood about uh, uh, getting into uh, and using that portion of Beacon Lane from Two Lights Road into our client's property. And uh, there was um, a condition imposed at the time that uh, that neighbors uh, not block Beacon R Road or Beacon Lane with rocks or cars, and I think those were the two items that I saw that were of concern to the board at that time. Um, now, in, in addressing that issue, our- Excuse me, could we have, it's hard enough for us to uh, concentrate on this. We, we have some talking in the audience, and I really would appreciate it if you would keep quiet and let the applicant make, its, uh, make uh, his presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as I understand it from, from our client, Elise Thibodeau and, and her uh, husband made considerable efforts to meet with neighbors and to get them to sign an agreement uh, stating affirmatively that they would not block the road and that they would not place objects in the road. And it became evident to them over the course of several years that, uh, try as they may, they were not going to get certain of the neighbors to agree to do anything. Uh, I'm not sure it was necessarily a, a, a statement that they were uh, unalterably opposed to what was being asked of them as much as it was simply intransigence of asking somebody uh, who was not interested in, in uh, participating in this way to, to agree to do something that was outside of their um, uh, daily routine. Um, when, when it became apparent to them that despite considerable efforts that they were not going to be able to get a written agreement, uh, they asked uh, our firm if we would look at the matter and uh, uh, determine whether there were any legal issues here that, that might weigh in their favor that hadn't been adequately considered. And we, we did give considerable effort to, uh, to looking at this situation from a legal perspective and, and going back through the, the legal information that uh, we uncovered, it, it is clear that uh, Beacon Lane at a point in time for better part of a hundred years was a public way as shown on on various maps and plans of the of the town going back into the into the 1800s 
And there is considerable law, uh, uh, statutory law in Maine, that where uh, a, a road, a public road is abandoned um, through non-use as opposed to uh, discontinuance by formal proceedings. I'm not suggesting the latter, but rather that it, it was uh, abandoned by uh, non-maintenance by the town. That in that situation, uh, while indeed it is no longer a public way through, through abandonment, the public retains a, a, an easement, a public, what's called a public easement, and that includes the right uh, to, um, for those people who would normally use the lane uh, to enter and exit from it without uh, a fear of it being blocked by neighbors, and indeed they have the right to, to enforce their, their rights. Uh, in addition to uh, this concept of a, of a public easement in the statute, there is also private property rights that, that we explained in a letter that's in one of the uh, attachments to your package that, uh, that we submitted, uh, explaining that uh, this property uh, has uh, uh, with it a private easement right uh, to enter and exit from uh, Two Lights Road via uh, the existing dirt entranceway or gravel entranceway of, of Beacon Lane. Um, for that reason, uh, we believe that there already existed a, a prohibition against a blocking. In other words, Elise Thibodeau and her husband have the legal right at any point in time if, if somebody should attempt to block their entrance or in, in their access to their lot to go to court and join that person from, from prohibiting and interfering with their right to, to get at their property. And, and because of this, uh, our conviction that this was a <laughs> a well-founded property right, uh, both through public easement and through private property rights. Uh, we wrote to uh, Ernest McVeigh and set forth our position, and I believe the, the town attorney uh, has concurred, although he, he makes a, a valid point that the road was not formally abandoned by the town, uh, or excuse me, formally discontinued by the town. It was abandoned through, through non-user, and I think the, the legal result, uh, while there, there are some consequences. Nonetheless, the, the significance of it is that, is that the right still, uh, I don't think he disputes the fact that the, that the right still exists in our clients to, uh, to prevent others from interfering with their access. So we think that E, while perhaps, uh, the subcondition E, while perhaps well intended by the board in the context of, of the legal rights of our client, should not be enforced at this point uh, to, the, to the extent of requiring them to get a written agreement to uh, memorial that which the law already uh, 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 allows them the, the right and the privilege to, uh, uh, to maintain access to their property. Uh, concerning site distances, uh, I, I wanted to make one point uh, uh, concerning a, a memorandum that the town planner had, uh, had submitted to the board. Um, we were not proposing in, in our application to, to substitute stopping distances for uh, the actual distances imposed in the ordinance. Uh, we have distances of 350 feet to the west and 250 feet to the, uh, to the east that are uh, uh, part of that order and, uh, that was issued back in 1990. And um, we have attempted to address those uh, through the reports of, of DeLuca Hoffman, and Tom Gorrell is here tonight. Um, we, we did propose uh, alternatively that the board consider stopping distances because uh, of the concerns uh, in both directions that I think will, will become clear as we go in uh, to the details of this application. There is a neighbor immediately uh, to the west uh, who has long maintained uh, the area of, of ledge that appears to be in the, in the public right of way as a garden and uh, wishes very strongly that, that uh, uh, we not engage in any effort that would uh, remove that ledge. And uh, to the uh, east, there is a lilac uh, hedge or growth that um, uh, it, it does interfere with uh, uh, the, the vision to the, to the east. Uh, we think it, 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 while it interferes, it's a seasonal interference. And uh, I think there is some, uh, some um, interpretive questions uh, concerning the extent of the, uh, the interference with the view. Uh, so for those reasons, uh, um, we think that, uh, as Mr. Gore will present, that we, we can, uh, with some adjustment, uh, meet the requirements of, of the, uh, the distances in either direction. Um, and, and we'd ask uh, uh, that the board consider uh, Mr. Gorrell's presentation as to what would be required in considering the views of the neighbors uh, uh, as to uh, site distances. 
please keep in mind as you hear this that, that Beacon Lane has been in existence now for many, many generations. It, it serves as access now, that, that entrance to, I believe, four houses, if not five, and, and uh, I'm not aware of any accidents at the site. So we have a long history of user there, and uh, we're uh, seeking at this point um, uh, simply to be allowed to use that as access for our clients so that they may uh, proceed with, with a building permit for their house. At this point, if I may, I would like to ask Mr. Gorrell to make his presentation. Thank you, Mr. Upton. Thank you, John. Uh, Madam Chairman and members of the board, my name is Tom Gorl. I'm with the engineering firm of DeLuca Hoffman, located in South Portland. And we were retained by Elise to uh, review the sight line situation at that lot and uh, evaluate it and make recommendations. Uh, as John has outlined, it for a single family home uh, proposal, is easily the most complicated I've, I've ever seen. Um, it's got a lot involved in it, and what I'd like to do tonight is just as briefly as I can go through the issues that are involved with it so you have a clear understanding of what the existing conditions are and what the options are available uh, to the Thibodeaux. Uh, first of all, the sight lines, there are um, a couple basic different types of sight lines. The first is stopping sight distance, and that's the distance that you would need to essentially come to a stop in somewhat of an emergency situation. It gives you time to react, to step on the brake, and to stop quickly. Um, that's not something that we we try to design for because certainly we want to have your stop more comfortable. In fact, we'd prefer not to have you to stop at all relative to a driveway. Uh, the second type of sight lines um, are safe entering sight lines. Those are the sight lines that generally required for a driveway uh, for someone to enter the, onto the main road uh, safely without interrupting the oncoming traffic by a significant degree. Usually that's, you know, 10 miles an hour, uh, more than 10 miles an hour. The standard for uh, stopping site distance is 150 uh, feet for a 25 mile an hour speed and uh, 250 for a 35 mile an hour speed. The safe entering site distance is what you have in your ordinance as 250 feet for 25 miles an hour and 350 feet for 35 miles an hour. Now, looking to the west of the site, this being Beacon Lane, um, this two lights road, looking to the west, the speed at which vehicles would be approaching would be 35 miles per hour. That's the posted speed. Looking to the east would be 25 miles an hour. So essentially to meet safe entering sight distance, we would like to have 350 feet to the west and 250 feet to the east. The sight lines that are available are 267 feet in this direction, that is to the west and 210 feet looking to the east. So that what you have is a situation where your safe entering site distance is not met, um, but your safe stopping site distance is met. So the requirements in your ordinance are for safe entering site distance, and those are not met. Um, as John indicated, there does not appear to be um, an accident history at that location. Um, so it's an existing situation, as he's pointed out. Um, what is proposed is to add a single family home to what's already there. 
Um, it's not a situation that they are certainly creating. The other issue here under existing conditions that you need to be aware of is that the road, as shown on the survey plan, appears to be outside of the right-of-way. Uh, the road comes around like this, in the, this fashion, and the right-of-way appears to jog into the middle of the road. That's the, the best available information. Um, I guess who knows what's really the case. Clearly, the road has been utilized in its current alignment for years, and I think everybody certainly assumed it was within the right-of-way. Having given you that background for existing conditions, the question is, what can we do? What, what options are available to the Thibodeaux to improve the sight lines? One option that's available would be to the west would be to lift the, uh, or fill, if you will, two lights road, lift it up so that you can gain sight lines and not lose them in a vertical depression. That's very expensive and I think clearly beyond the ability for a single uh, family house lot to support uh, to improve that existing condition. The second option available would be to um, lift or fill in Beacon Lane. There's a little depression there now. We could lift Beacon Lane up by three to four inches and improve the sight line somewhat, but we still can't meet uh, the ordinance. We would improve the sight lines in that area from about 267 feet to about 290 if we did lift it that three inches. Another question is why don't we lift it more than three inches? That's a possibility. Um, I would have another problem probably with the ordinance at that point though in that I'm going to exceed the what we'd try to keep to a 3% approach grade to the intersection. So I'd, I'd run afoul of a, of a second condition there. Um, another option available to them is to remove the ledge. Now the ledge, again, this is the uh, Beacon Lane. The ledge outcrop is located here to the right and blocks your line of vision vertically. If we could cut down the ledge, this heavy line through here would be, if we could cut the, down the ledge between that heavy line and the edge of Two Lights Road, which is within the right of way, we would be able to meet sight lines in that direction. Your sight line standards of, of 350 feet uh, for entering sight distance for a posted speed of 35 miles an hour. Those are the options available to us in that direction. As John indicated, there, the abutter doesn't appear to have a lot of concern with regard to where the, the property line is down Beacon Lane. They do have a lot of concern with removing any ledge in that area. Uh, they have maintained a, I guess you'd call it a rock garden or something in here. Some of it appears to be in the right of way based on our survey. But they have a lot of concern about that. Looking to the east in the other direction, in that direction, we have a situation which you've encountered, I'm sure, before when you're exiting a driveway where you can see a car very far away and then it disappears because of an obstruction and then reappears in your line of sight. That's what we have here. The car is actually visible uh, 340 feet away, which obviously exceeds the 250 feet uh, requirement. The issue is, though, that it gets to 250, well, once it, as it approaches you, it disappears in the neighborhood of 300 and 280, something like that. And you don't see it again until about 210 feet away. The 210 feet is below the 250 feet required in your ordinance. So we don't have an uninterrupted sight line um, of 250 feet. We have an uninterrupted sight line of 210. But it's a situation we can see further, and it, it gets interrupted, and they reappear. 
What are the options to correct that? Essentially, it's clearing an area back in here, some bushes that are actually obstructing the line of sight. Those bushes, that would be correcting, obviously, the existing deficiency there today. And those bushes are located outside the right of way. So, and that neighbor has been approached and does not want anything trimmed or altered in any way. So you can see those are the options that are available um, to the Thibodeaux. We've gone through them with them and we're at a point where it doesn't appear that um, the options available to us are options that the neighbors would like pursued at all. Um, so we're not, you know, we, we don't appear to be able to, to meet that requirement without um, concern with them. We don't have clearly the ability to clear brush outside the right of way to correct that existing condition. We do have the ability to remove the ledge to meet the sight line because that's within the right of way, but that's going to uh, create some issues. So with that, I don't know if John has anything else to add. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Tom. And let me try to summarize a, a few uh, points that I, I think may help you in your deliberation. Um, I'd first like to talk about the, uh, the fact that we are not going under the new ordinance and the implications for that. And I, I, I would point out that uh, the new ordinance, which became effective, uh, on, I believe, on June 4th, which was after we submitted our application, um, does not appear under, at least my, my reading of it, to uh, involve distances at all at, in the calculation of um, uh, whether or not a, a permittee ought to be permitted uh, to use a, a private road for uh, access purposes for establishing frontage to get a, a building permit. Uh, so in your, in your deliberations tonight, I would ask you to keep in mind that apparently on a, on a, a policy basis, the, the town of Cape Elizabeth as recently as several weeks ago has, has determined that, that it is no longer going to uh, impose uh, rigid site distance standards in considering this issue. And we think that that does have some bearing, at least on the tenor and, and uh, the strictness of your uh, imposing uh, uh, our standards now. Because I think it, it, if it's not clear, and I haven't stated this, uh, you do have the ability to waive these provisions. Uh, the ordinance, the old ordinance, clearly allows you to do that. And I, I think based on a um, demonstrated history uh, of, of user of that road now going for better part of a century, uh, the fact that there are multiple houses on the road, there have been no accidents, um, the, the town on a policy basis is no longer enforcing uh, the requirement of, uh, of distances. And I see the, uh, the chairman looking through her, her plan. I'd be happy to give you references if that would be useful. Um, but the, clearly, it, it is not there. And, and I think for that reason, I, I would suggest to you that the board does have significant discretion here and would not be uh, going against a, a strict uh, policy of the, of the town in, in granting a little leeway here to, to move on for a difficult situation that, that uh, is, is certainly not of our client's making and, and would allow uh, her to proceed with, with building on a house and a lot that she's owned for 10 years and hasn't been able to use. Um, I, I understand um, that, that there are neighbors who are concerned. Uh, we would like to, to uh, um, be able to work with those neighbors. And it was really for that reason that, that I decided uh, uh, to go under the old ordinance rather than simply abandon the process to date and, and move forward to the new, new situation. I, uh, I don't want to get into an interpretive question about an old ordinance, new ordinance, having a permit sort of half have done and um, all the implications there. I thought it was better to come 
straight before you to tell you what the facts were the best we could and, and to, uh, to ask you to look carefully at, at what we're able to do here and, and to make a decision we think that is supported and, in, and doesn't run counter to, to public policy. Uh, I'm certainly happy to answer questions. I know there's a great deal of history here and uh, uh, I'm sure Mr. Gore will be available too. Thank you, Mr. Upton. For the um, benefit of Chair. <laughs> yes, um, Mr. Emery. I apologize. Before we get into any discussion, I should disclose that uh, I am uh, under contract with Luca Hoffman doing uh, landscape design for the new Portland jet port. Uh, I've completed the design phase. They're in construction now, and it's just a, on an on-call basis. It wasn't until I saw Tom standing at the podium that the light went on that I may <laughs> be perceived of having a, a conflict in this matter. Uh, I think I could render an, a... a uh, a fair judgment in the, in the matter, but I think for uh, appearances I should recuse myself from this application unless the board feels otherwise. I always respect uh, a board member's proffer of recusal and I believe that with any potential for pecuniary gain from an application that you need to recuse yourself. I'm not so sure about a supporting something because the Luca Hoffman is not the, the applicant itself. But uh, be interested to hear how other board members feel or Mr. Emery if you feel. Well, you, for the you, record, there's certainly no pecuniary gain to be had from the applicant in this matter. I share the view, Madam Chair. It's too remote. It, 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 um, there, is, there is no obvious. If I, Once the disclosure has been made, disclosure has been made. I, uh, there's obviously no gain one way or the other, and uh, I, w I would value the input and see no conflict. Mr. Carlson, you're nodding your head. Would you I like to put some you. words to that? Okay, Mr. Wilcox. Um, I would not be uncomfortable at all with Mr. Emery continuing on with this application, given the fact that he's. Uh, not under contract for uh, a project related to this one that we're discussing and have financial gain from it. Also, I believe he's one of the only people who actually has some historical connection. Yes, I guess I should also state Other to the director the that uh, Mr. Emery and I were the only two that were on the planning board in 1990 when this Still thing came up. It. So uh, I don't know how good Mr. Emery's institutional memory is, but... <laughs> And you don't have to answer that question. No, I... Mr. Cotter? I would be very comfortable having Mr. Emery remain seated. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for bringing it to our attention, Mr. Emery, and we will <coughs> remain constituted as we are. Uh, I should also note that because this is an... I'm sorry, Mr. Eisling, did you have a comment in addition to... N not related to that, something else when you're ready. No, no hurry. Go right ahead. I, I just really had two questions. If you wanted to take them later, it's fine, whatever you want. Well, I guess my, my purpose in uh, introducing this for the benefit of those in the audience here and also for those at home is that this procedure for an, app, for an amendment to a public access waiver that was granted seven years ago is, shall we say, a little out of the ordinary. There are no... Uh, wonderfully black and white rules for us to follow in a, in a procedure of this sort. The first question I had for board members was, is there any question about the completeness of the materials and the presentation that we've had before us? We certainly, uh, to my mind, have a, a, a very nice and complete package to review, but uh, just in general, that seems to be the first question to raise. Anybody have any concerns in that area? No. Mm -hmm. Um, how would the board like to proceed? I guess we have some questions about uh, that we could ask the applicant. We also have the question of whether we want to go with the site walk, whether we want to notice a public hearing for the um, next time around. I do understand that there is some concern in the neighborhood and our policy is generally to try to take uh, as much information as we can, but I also want to use the time well here. So, Mr. Rosalino, do you have any particular comments in light of those comments? I, I, um, 
We'll ad address this uh, generally, perhaps it's to the town planner or, or to you, uh, Madam Chair, but, but um, uh, two questions. The first is, we have a, a letter in our package, which I assume everyone has seen from town, town council, that, that and, and if I'm reading it correct, please correct me if I'm wrong, basically says there is no provision for amendments to previously approved public access waiver and then an applicant would need to file a public access waiver application under 194-2B as if it were a new application. Now, if, if I understand that correctly, the town council is advising us that we would have to require a new application and therefore don't have the ability, the right to approve amendments. Am I misinterpreting that? Not to my knowledge, but Ms. Ms. Town Planner may have something to say. Um, I've had several discussions with the applicant on this. It was my recommendation to just go for a new application. Uh, they chose to submit an amendment. Uh, they've made an argument that um, because the Planning Board adopts Robert's Rules of Order, that Robert's Rules allow amendments, uh, I believe that the uh, Planning Board Chair has most accurately described this as no black and white rules. And we're kind of in this difficult situation where uh, if the applicant submits a new application, in theory they should be under the new ordinance. There's nothing in the new ordinance that says it, it voids all previous Planning Board approvals. So you, you can't just pretend that there wasn't an approval in 1990. There's a standing Planning Board approval. Someone asked me, just yesterday, don't those things expire? And I said, no, public access waivers don't expire. Everything else does, but not a public access waiver. So, well, then, then, then um, and, and somebody disagree with me. Then, if we, uh, as as a as a board, agree to consider amendments, we are going against the advice of town council. Is that correct? Maybe. It's, uh, and well, I wish we'll clarify I that, please, because if there's a subsequent letter, it's very clear to me that that's what the this last, letter said. The last letter I heard from town council, and perhaps Mr. Upton may want to step up to the podium and, oh, please, and, 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 and utter his, um, his opinion on the matter. But the last I heard was our town attorney said that it should be a new application. Thank you. And the second uh, uh, question um, is a mechanical one. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll address it to Mr. Upton or whoever wants to speak uh, 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 to it. I, I, the question it relates to the sight lines to the east, and that is, is the 210 feet to the east unobstructed? Uh, I'm going to allow no, that's, Mr. That's, uh, I said to answer that. I believe it is. But. Correct. It, it is unobstructed. unobstructed. Thank you. Mr. Upton, would you like to address uh, Mr. Aslino's first question? Well, I, I, I'm somewhat surprised that this is still an issue. I go back to a letter that town council wrote on November 27, 1996. It is item 7 in your packet. Uh, in which we were told as a result of our submission regarding the legally block, uh, the legal blockage issue that uh, in his opinion this didn't satisfy the requirement of the condition if we wanted to um, have something done with that the applicant should seek a waiver of this condition they should ask the planning board for such a waiver <coughs> Is that is that um, that, that is, is that in tab the, seven? Yes, that's the second, the last line, second to last line of paragraph two of tab seven of the submission. Uh, I, I certainly am not interested in in um, dragging the board through an extensive uh, legal analysis of of the inherent rights of a board to to uh, consider and act on an earlier decision. I. I tried to keep the legalese to uh, what I thought was an appropriate level for the purposes of the submission. I did find case law that suggested that the board had the power to reconsider uh, 
on a substantive basis as well as procedurally. I, I simply, I'm not suggesting that Robert's Rules is anything other than procedure, but it is your procedure, and you have adopted it. And substantively, I have cited to you authority that allows you uh, to consider this issue. It is unfortunate there are, are no case law uh, that I'm aware of in Maine that, that, that addresses specifically this issue. There is in other states. And, and I think that the sum and substance of that is if the board believes that this condition no longer serves a, a valid public uh, purpose, that, that it has the, uh, the power to, uh, to reconsider that decision and, and to remove it as a condition. And that's what we ask you to do. Mr. Upton, would the applicant be under any disadvantage whatsoever if you made a, uh, an application under the new zoning ordinance? And if so, what uh, disadvantage would that be? I, I th have s um, several comments. I think uh, this goes back to a comment Ms. Amira made to me when I first um, was discussing this procedural dilemma. Um, the old order is a standing order of this board, and I, I guess I have to concur that I don't know that uh, the, the adoption of a new ordinance uh, can do anything to change that. And so the planning board, it seems to me, on a, uh, I'd have to come back and ask you to withdraw your old order mm -hmm. and then proceed under the new, the new zoning ordinance. I don't even come before you. This isn't a planning board matter anymore. Uh, uh, Mr. McVeigh rules on, on the, uh, the question. Uh, so if, if this board uh, uh, is of a mind that it has no authority uh, or, or wishes not to act on this matter, I think the, probably the procedural next step would be to submit some kind of um, um, proceeding of, of a kind I, I'm not sure I would know the name of, but to withdraw the prior uh, pending uh, order and, and ask uh, the board to vacate that order so that we could proceed under the new ordinance. Now, I think, I think substantively, let's, let's move back from the, the law here and just talk about some, some common sense here. I think substantively that probably does make sense in the context of an ordinance that has been, in, in my view, substantially lax in, in, in the context of the requirements of, of uh, uh, the applicant. It is clearly the, the town has stepped back, and I think for that reason, recognizing that zoning is a restriction on property rights, that the law would favor uh, the, the uh, abandonment of an old order to allow an applicant to come in and take advantage of a, of a new position by the town which doesn't have the same substantial restrictions that the old order has, the old ordinance has. But, so but that, the answer to the question that I asked was, what, I, what downside, if any, would be there? I would. If you I would. The I think there is there is some. Speak to the, the requirements of the of the new ordinance. Uh, there is some question about whether or not this is a a, a road shown on a, on an approved subdivision plan. If it is, then I don't think I have any requirements other than to come before Mr. McBain and, and require and request a, a building permit. If it is not, then there are two requirements that need to be met. I would need to be able to demonstrate that there was a legally binding arrangement with the users of Beacon Lane and excuse me, a, 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 I'm not sure it would be with the users, but an ar arrangement as distinct from an agreement, which is, pr is the language which appears in a, in a um, uh, similar section where you have a new road. If it's an old road, the language of the ordinance is arrangement. New road, it's agreement. And I assume there's some intended distinction. I don't know the difference in what was intended by the city council and the town council in those matters. I preferred with what I thought was a relatively straightforward request to, to deal with two, two uh, uh, conditions to have this board address it and deal with it straight on rather than to get into interpretive questions whether I have need an arrangement or an agreement. And then I, I think on top of that, the second requirement is to, is to go back to uh, uh, the fire chief. We have a new fire chief, and I don't know what his point of view is, the old one. Uh, as of 1990, did not uh, have a problem with uh, uh, this and had written a letter uh, to that effect. But we have a new fire chief, so um, new uncertainties. Um, I'd, 
feel a lot more comfortable if we could get these two issues resolved in a way that was workable for our client and, and move on. This board would re retain jurisdiction, uh, uh, do it up front and straightforward, and, and call, it, <coughs> call it as we see it. So I, that's my preference, um, and that's why I, I cast this the way I did. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Mr. Aslino, any follow up question? No, for, for, um, uh, for, for, for purposes of, of explanation, the reason that, that I asked the question is just that. I don't agree with the logic at all. I just wanted it clarified in terms of what our uh, authority okay. is. Do you, you, you disagree with my logic? or the, I don't uh, disagree with your logic. Uh, okay, I, I'm uh, pleased at all. That. I just wanted it clarified yeah. for, for purposes of the question because I think it's important. Mm. Well, I, I think on a just on a, a fundamental common sense back basis, if you have the power to impose the condition for appropriate procedural uh, uh, reasons, you, you ought to be able to, to remove that condition, provided the public gets notice, opportunity to be heard, and there's a good grounds for it. Mr. Wilcox. Um, I have a question along the same lines, which then proceeds into some physical aspects of the site. Do you, do you feel on a, on a sounder basis in terms of having a, uh, a, a sounder uh, approval for the property to proceed on this basis of uh, modifying the existing as opposed to vacating the existing? I, I would prefer to, to proceed on the, the okay. application we've submitted. Because reviewing under the old older public access waivers, uh, one of the things, uh, if you saw it in our package, is a review from the town engineer saying that the sight lines to the east are interrupted by 30 percent of their required distance, and that does not fall under the uh, intention of the ordinance of isolated trees and signs and individual obstructions. Uh, another aspect that uh, I would wonder if you could address a little bit, uh, well, the police chief also cited traffic on the road as being a hazard. Uh, and one of the things that I noticed uh, that you have considered is relocating the road to within its right-of-way, uh, which at first blush looks like it would make it extremely difficult for the town's ladder truck to make it into the site. Uh, and that's something that I know that the fire chief does look for on all our public access waivers. So there are sort of three counts here under the old, old one, which is common sense disregarded. They're in the ordinance, and they're, well, there, are, there, are, there are things that we have to look at. I, I, I will try to address those. I, yeah. I will be the first to acknowledge this is an area that uh, is going to, would require the, the board to, to exercise some discretion and, and, uh, and some leeway in the strict uh, application of all those provisions. Mm -hmm. So I, I fr freely acknowledge that um, there are some concerns and legitimate concerns. On the lilacs, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a seasonal uh, vegetation. Um, it, it is on private property. Uh, I think the, uh, for that reason alone, we, we simply are unable to, to enter it, to, to remove it. And for that, for that basis, where we have an existing road, uh, notwithstanding the police chief, and I have spoken to him at some length uh, you know, yesterday about this situation, and while I know he, he uh, is certainly mindful of protecting the, the public's interest, I, I think he, he understands the difficulties that we're working with. I, I'm not going to try to speak for him. He's, he's obviously not here tonight. But uh, it, it is a situation in which a neighbor has, has not been uh, inclined, despite efforts uh, to, to contact that neighbor through certified mail, regular mail and other uh, activities that Mrs. Uh, Thibodeau has pursued over the years um, with, with just general intransigence. Uh, 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 so we have a, a, a seasonal uh, bush that is, is interfering with, uh, with the view for a, a, a period of time, but it, isn't, it has not uh, precipitated an accident. Uh, it, it, it does allow uh, a, a break, but um, there is a, a period, as, as Mr. Quarles pointed out, uh, in, further away where you can see the cars. Um, the, the right of way, as I've, as I've indicated, uh, or excuse me, Mr. Goral indicated, I don't think that uh, the neighbor to the, uh, to the west is objecting to the current location of the road, provided 
they aren't asked to, to, uh, to bear the, the brunt of, of a lot of construction in the, in the front of their yard that they've uh, been, been putting a lot of time and energy, and I can understand that. And so again, I think uh, looking in that direction uh, in the West, uh, uh, we can do some things. We, we, if the board it requires us to do it all, we'll certainly be mindful of the board's position to the West. Uh, it, it is in the right of way, and I think we would have the, the ability to go in there, but I, I think the board ought to consider uh, uh, the views of the neighbors and, and the fact that uh, this is a site that has been in existence for the, for the length of time it has. Comments from other board members? Mr. Emery. Uh, several questions. Um, I guess the first uh, is that we have uh, a packet that we re received from the applicant, and for all practical purposes, it appears to be an uh, application for public access waiver. Uh, that line item is checked under the type of review, and then under other, uh, it's also checked modification of conditions, uh, et cetera, signed by the uh, uh, John Upton and dated May 1997. Uh, I guess my question is, what is lacking from this application that, that, that would be required in addition to have a complete application as a new application? Ms. O'Meara? If someone, someone didn't tell me this was a, an amendment to an application, I think it would be hard to some extent to perceive the difference. Um, in the, the, the ordinance that was in effect prior to June 4th, 1997, uh, there were, I believe it was seven criteria that were required for public access waivers. Uh, you had to show the width of the right-of-way, the width of the traveled way, uh, drainage, whether or not it crossed uh, the, town, the town road. Uh, you had to show a, an area that, had be, that was to be paved that intersected with the town road a distance of 50 feet from the road. Um, you also had to show a turnaround. Um, I believe the other two, the, the site distance criteria, is the one that's being asked to be waived or, or adjusted uh, here. But um, just to try to, to help the board a little with what the status of this, this application is, you know, we, I've discussed this with the applicant's representative many times and, and suggested that the key come forward with the most reasonable uh, request he could. Um, he brought forward the whole idea of uh, coming in under the new ordinance, and I said, you know, if you can find a way to get out from the old planning board order, I'm interested to hear about it. And um, we, we never talked about it again, so my assumption is that he couldn't think of any way out of it either. Um, coming in under the old ordinance uh, seems to be the most reasonable approach. Um, it certainly is not the cleanest way procedurally. There's no, I have not been able to figure out a, a procedure that has all the T's crossed and the I's dotted under our old ordinance or under our new ordinance. It's something that I, I what I would recommend is that the board uh, make every effort to take a, a common sense approach, articulate what, what your reasoning is and, and move from there. Um, one other thing you should be aware of is that um, under the new ordinance, my understanding is that this would come in under the existing private road standards and those two requirements which are on page 139 are one that you, you could get a permit if you could meet these two standards. And if you can't meet the two standards, you have to find a way to meet them. The first standard is that based upon the recommendation of the fire chief, the road provides all adequate all-season emergency access for the existing and proposed use. And two, legal, legally binding arrangements exist to provide for the long-term maintenance of the road. Uh, without going any further than, pers without pursuing an approval under the new ordinance, I think it's not unrealistic to see that other issues could be raised if you were to bring this application under the new ordinance. Um, the new ladder truck was not in the town's ownership in 1990. I have several yes, uh, Mr. Other Emery. questions. Um, I think one of the, uh, clearly the issue here is the issue of safety with respect to either the sight distance or the stopping distance. Uh, and the issue in, in terms of uh, dealing with the neighbors, as has been discussed uh, in developing the new ordinance language, is, is a bit of double jeopardy. There's no incentive for the neighbors to act cooperatively um, 
So I, I certainly can't fault the applicant for, for not having tried to meet the condition that was uh, set forth, and perhaps it may have been an impossible condition to meet. Um, I, I'd like to get, I guess, right to the meat of the matter here. Are there, have there been any accidents reported at this intersection, or is it uh, in any way classified as a, uh, a problematic intersection? No, it's not. Uh, is, did you check to see what uh, level of what accident rate or, or uh, uh, any other information similar to that? Ms. Thibodeau, would you approach the podium if you want to address the board? We do have a letter from the chief of police in 1990, um, David Pickering. He says, to whom it may concern, after a computer enhancer to provide traffic records for the past five years, we find no record of any reportable motor vehicle accidents at the intersection of Two Lights Road and Beacon Lane. And the date of that is 1990? 1990. And was there any update on that in preparation for this application? Uh, yes, I spoke to the chief uh, yesterday, and he advised me that there, he is unaware of any accidents ever at the site. Uh, following up with that, how many houses are, s are not including the paved end of the street? How many uh, either trips or houses or lots are served by this uh, uh, access road? I think five, four or five. Five. And the application is for a single, single family house, is that correct? And it's the last one on that property. Mm -hmm. Uh, do the houses at the paved end of, of this road use this? Do they, do they uh, when they come to Two Lights Road, do they come in this direction or do they uh, travel over their paved road and head back the other all opposite direction? There are members of the public here who uh, use that other end of the road, and they perhaps can speak, but I would assume they use the paved road. Uh, Let's talk about procedure a little bit more. I mean, we've got the substantive issue before us, and we also have the issue of a public hearing in which we could find out some of this kind of information. I do not know whether the board is interested in a public hearing or whether the board feels that the written materials that have already been submitted to the board are um, give a fairly clear uh, message about what the neighbors feel. So I'm not trying to really cut you off, Mr. Emery. No, that's, just to try that's to fine. I can put that question aside for the time being. Okay. I have one more question mm -hmm. of the of, of Mr. Goral. Uh, is there, <coughs> excuse me, any precedence in light of the uh, lack of any evidence of accidents in, at this intersection, the fact that this road has been here for some time? Uh, is there any precedence for using any additional signage uh, other than reducing the speed limit further, such as a uh, uh, blind curb ahead or whatever the typical uh, warning uh, information might be that might help uh, warn people of this, uh, this intersection? Well, actually, there are two parts to that question. And one option that uh, I should have mentioned when I was up here before that uh, does help the applicant in this direction uh, would be for the town to request the speed limit uh, 25 mile an hour zone to be extended in a westerly direction. The speed limit within all public ways is controlled by the DOT, by its statute. And the procedure for getting it changed is that the town um, through usually the town manager has to make a request to the DOT to, in this case, extend a 25 mile an hour speed limit. Um, they could, um, the DOT would then review that and make a recommendation as to whether they thought that was appropriate or not. And that is another one of these options that, that could be done. But that, again, is really not in the applicant's hand because that's up to the the town has to make that request. The applicant can't. With regard to the second part of your question, um, there certainly are uh, occasions where things can't be met and there are blind driveway type of signs uh, put up. Um, that usually is, you know, kind of a last resort type of thing. Uh, but there, um, there is, that's been done before, certainly. Thank you. 
I mean, without editorializing, it would seem to uh, uh, the, the case would be that regardless of this application, that there is a uh, safety concern at this intersection, at least uh, technically. Uh, certainly, the history of, of accidents don't don't seem to support that, but um, that you know that may be a, a concern for the town to address, as regardless of the uh, disposition of this application. I guess, generally speaking. Um, uh, I'm just concerned that this application is really getting mired in procedure and uh, we're losing track of the common sense issue. Um, we have talked a lot about the, the rural character of Cape Elizabeth and there are certainly clearly uh, places in town where the, the roads are designed in such a way or laid out in such a way that it becomes difficult to meet the town standards, to meet current sight line standards, although when one comes in for a public access waiver that triggers uh, you know, that one has to meet the current standards. Um, I would like to, uh, you know, get, I think, more to the common uh, sense of this, of this issue and see if some combination of signage, and uh, I certainly understand the neighbors' concerns about removing lilacs. Lilacs along uh, rural roads in Cape Elizabeth are, are just, I mean, you drive around this time of year and they're just splendid. And I hate to think that every road in Cape Elizabeth and every intersection, particularly where there's no accident, uh, occurrence would require us to uh, clear it. Um, uh, I, guess, I guess that's all I'll say for now. Um, my sense is that uh, if the planner is speaking to the issue of common sense, whether the, the uh, Corporation Council has, has suggested that an entirely new application be submitted uh, versus what we are reviewing this evening, I, I think the, the, the information that, that is necessary to make a decision, uh, perhaps in addition to a site walk, uh, is before us and how that's handled procedurally and whether there's any legal fallout uh, after the, the board votes. But I certainly feel comfortable that uh, with the way in which the information has been submitted and the, in the level of detail that's been submitted uh, so far. So uh, I'm not really quite so hung up on the procedural issues, particularly in light of the fact that this application has been um, outstanding for some time. I'd, I'd really like to bring it to some conclusion. Thank you, Mr. Emery. Mr. Carlson. The police chief in his June 6 letter makes reference to the bike path. That's on the south side of Two Lights Road? Both sides. Both sides of Two Lights. And when they do put the bike paths in, will they be infringing then on the right of way, widening the right of way of that road to accommodate the bike path? I'm not working on that project specifically. I don't believe that there's any need to take additional right of way, but obviously the area that is being, you know, the, the, area, the area of the right of way that's being taken up by road and road type facilities will increase. And the but bike path will be how wide? Six feet, as I recall, or four? I think it's either four, it's either four or six. Okay. And I'm on not either side of that road? On either You're gonna side. You're going to take eight feet without it, without <coughs> you see what I'm leading up to is what happens said, to the I, I site. I have not seen the plans myself, bike. but I have not heard that there's a need to take additional land for <coughs> He also makes reference into his memo, he states, I am requesting that the planning board allow the original approval for the public access waiver to stands to stand as regards to the site distance on Two Lights Road. Then he goes on, I have visited this location this week and determined that this intersection is currently chancy at best. It would become more so as bicyclists are encouraged to use the road. In one sentence, he says, let it stay the way it is. And the next sentence, he says, it's a chancy little intersection. So I don't quite understand um, what, he's, what he's trying to say there. I think what he's saying is that, that the site distance requirements as originally required in the 1990 approval should stand. OK. Thank you. I didn't, I didn't mean to interrupt, but that's why mm -hmm. I he also invites, I believe, in the last sentence, if you have any further questions, to please yes. contact him so we could yes, ask him for clarification. I also had the same general questions that you did. Mr. Wilcox. Um, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but uh, wouldn't it appear then uh, one of the things that we're considering here is a means of measuring the station point or the viewing point, if you will, for where these measurements are taken instead of being measured from the center line of the road, being measured 10 feet back from edge of pavement, and the police chief may be aware that in the near future the edge of pavement is also going to move back, so that the point we're measuring from might be in the bike lane. Uh, 
given all of this, I would sort of feel good about sort of seeing it in the flesh, to, to tell you the I truth. I was hoping that's where you were going with that comment. Any other comments? Could I ask uh, again a, a, a clarifying question on the sight distances? By all means. Um, because I'm not sure I understand this. The, could, you, could you please state, the, without any changes <laughs> to the existing road, not raising it three inches, not doing anything, what are the unobstructed sight distances to the east and west with no change? No cutting any bushes, no, no removing any ledge, Yes, and giving us as a reference where you're measuring from. Uh, okay. Thank you, yes. The reference would be 10 feet back from the existing edge of travel way on Two Lights Road. The sight distance to the west, looking to the right as you're exiting Beacon Lane, is 267 feet. Looking to the east or to the left, as you're exiting Beacon Lane is 210 feet. Further questions, comments? Mr. Wilcox. Uh, I have a question for uh, Mr. Gorrell, and I was just wondering what the uh, advantages would be versus disadvantages of, um, is, there, is there in fact any desirability to try to put Beacon Lane back in its right of way? It, it, it appears like that might be something which runs counter to the site, also runs counter to the sight lines and access needs of that road that, as it exists right now for all the residents on that road. I'd agree with your assessment of that, particularly what you said earlier about uh, turning movements. It's a real zigzag. It would become the right of way is 90 degree, it comes into a 90 degree uh, yeah. angle and then also intersects Two Lights Road at an odd angle. You prefer it to intersect Two Lights Road at a 90 degree angle if possible. So in no way would I recommend that the existing road be put back into that right away. Okay. Uh, is is there a statement, Mr. Carl? Thank you very much. Mr. Emery? Uh, just so we cover all the bases, um, has there been any assessment of the turning movements in exiting Beacon Lane or entering Be Beacon Lane uh, as to which site distance is the more critical? That is, if the predominance of traffic is, um, well, evidently, if they're leaving Beacon Lane and turning right, at some point they will return and turn left, uh, in, in which case both turning movements would be, I mean, the sight line would be most critical to the east. Haven't done a turning movement count there. Um, they would probably be bored to death if they did, because uh, all the time that I've sat there, I don't think I've actually seen a vehicle exit there, and I'm, I'm sure they do. But um, there's very little traffic, so I couldn't, without staying there essentially all day, probably get anything that had any statistical significance uh, to you. Um, the existing. Five, uh, five watts would, in theory, generate something like, if you assume 10 trip ends, that's ins and outs, a day per unit, we would be up to 50. It doesn't appear to me that that's that high at that location. And so we would be adding 10 additional to that. But we have not counted that because of the low level of traffic. Um. The, the issue that the planning board often faces in a situation like this is we've been uh, provided um, uh, correspondence or memos from the fire chief and police chief, and the police chief has certainly expressed a concern about safety issues with respect to the site distances. Uh, again, however, the records seem to indicate quite the opposite. This may be maybe not one of the safer intersections, but sometimes more hazardous condition. Uh, people are a little more careful in, in uh, uh, driving. Um, I'm not sure how to ask this question, but in your professional opinion, uh, given the, the available site distances, uh, do you have any uh, concerns with uh, suggesting that the board uh, uh, waive those uh, 
requirements to those that are uh, present, presently available. If you wish not to answer the question, I certainly honor your desire not to. I have, uh, and the firm of DeLuca Hoffman, has always, um, I guess, one of the key issues when we review plans is we always like to have adequate sight lines. That's something that um, I think even my colleagues think that I'm probably too sensitive on that issue. In this case, um, and I would not call it the rule, I am not as concerned about it as I normally would be, given the very low volume that is there today, and as you pointed out, the very low amount of, uh, uh, well, no accidents at that location. Um, gave that a lot of thought, because I really do try to stick to those uh, sight line standards. Um, but in this case, I think that our recommendation certainly would be to try to achieve the sight lines, if at all possible. And that really is the recommendation to our client. And it would be to the town to correct an existing deficiency that's there today. Request that the speed limit be ex reduced, that 25 mile an hour zone be carried through. Um, if we are going to be adding a bike, route, I believe it probably is, as opposed to a lane, but if we are adding a bike route out there, certainly sight lines are, you know, an issue you'd, you'd want to try to make them improve. But given all that, we've weighed it, and it would be our opinion that uh, in this particular case, you know, we would not have a reservation. That's not something that I would apply generally. I, I do think you should try to meet the sight line standards that are presented in your ordinance. Thank you. Any further comments or questions from board members? Ms. Mira. I just want the board to note that I've had conversations with several people who live in the area, um, and there's been some requests for a public hearing. Some requests for what? I'm sorry. A public, a public, public hearing. hearing. All right. Let's uh, proceed, if, if we can. Uh, the first issue that I'd like to have us address is um, we, we've sort of talked about this before but I'd like to go back and revisit it now that we've had more of a full discussion of this and that is are we content as a board to move forward on the application based on the materials that we have before us this in this procedural configuration, are we satisfied that we have jurisdiction and are able to proceed? Does anybody want to have any further comment or discussion about that? I take it then that, don't let me put words in your mouth, but that no one has any questions mm -hmm. about that and that we are, we feel comfortable about proceeding. Yes. Okay. Um, Second thing is I've had I've heard some talk about site walk. What is the pleasure of the board with respect to that? I think Mr. Wilcox is interested. Uh, anybody else interested in the site walk? Well, I'll, I, I'll comment on it. I I um, will support Mr. Wilcox. I'm not interested in the site walk, but I am or am not. I'm not. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in in view of what we're looking at. Common sense should prevail here, and, and, and in my view, a site walk can only aid uh, the application of, uh, of uh, common sense, which is what I think is needed. So I, would, for one, would be prepared to vote on the issue uh, this evening, but um, I think it makes uh, sense you would not for the board you would not oppose a site walk, then. to have a site walk. Mm -hmm. Further comments on sidewalk? I'll concur with that approach. I'm prepared to vote this evening, but I would certainly support a sidewalk if the board would like to hold a sidewalk. <coughs> Madam Chair, I have visited the site with the application presented here tonight in hand, but uh, and don't personally feel a need for a sidewalk, but I would support one if other board members would request one. Well, I've driven the 
road in the last couple of days, so I guess, uh, and but because I was a member of the original team, I don't have a crying need for a sidewalk, but I always think one is, uh, you know, fairly useful. So, Mr. Carlson? I've walked it many, many, many times. <laughs> <laughs> Madam. I'm sure both the applicants and the abutters recognize me, probably. Mad Mr. Wilcox. Madam Chair, I don't, I, I don't want my co former comments to be taken th uh, to mean that we need to meet as a board and have an official meeting on the site, but I, for, I for one, if, if given the chance, would go by if this is, uh, is not resolved this evening in the meantime just to see it. Thank you. Then it sounds like we don't really have a need for a um, uh, formal site walk, but uh, some need to have board members who have not visited do visit at some point. What is the board's, my, my, my third thing on my own agenda then is the possibility of a public hearing. How does the board feel about that? Mr. Carlson. I think based on the history of uh, this property, we, we almost, sh we, we, we should have a public hearing. Uh, only because there seems to be a lot of concern with the butters, there's some letters in our packet tonight. Uh, I would hope that a public hearing would help the situation uh, as opposed to f further dividing whatever there's out there. I don't know the history back there at all. I wasn't even in town in 1990. But I sense some, I use the word animosity, and I, I really am finding it very difficult this evening to know of someone who owns a piece of property which is used by four other homes, because that's I, there's four other houses on that road that I assume go in and out, and this particular property owner can't do anything. I mean, something is wrong, um, either in the application or the, or, the, or the procedures or whatever there is. But how can a person own a piece of property and own it for 10 years and can't get to it? It just seems to me maybe a public hearing might clear that up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. Anybody else? Uh, I see some nodding on this side, yeah. interest in public hearing. I must say that as a general rule, the board, when there is any expression of interest uh, from members of the public in terms of be wanting to be heard on a particular application, our uh, standard operating procedure is to uh, to try to hold a public hearing because we generally think it is in the best interest of all concerned. So with that uh, discussion in mind, do I uh, hear a motion or any further comments and questions from the applicant tonight? Mr. Carlson? I'll make a motion. <clears throat> Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Elise Thibodeau and Kevin Zorsky for amendments to the previous public access waiver granted for Beacon Lane U15-66 be tabled to the regular July 15, 1997 meeting of the Planning Board at which, a time, at which time a public hearing shall be held. Do I hear a second to the motion? Second. Thank you, Mr. Cotter. All in favor of that motion, raise your right hand. Opposed? Four to two. Okay. I'd like to state for the record that uh, the board always encourages uh, expressions of uh, comments and, and concerns from neighbors in writing as well as the public hearing, but there will be a public hearing that will be scheduled at the next meeting. The date is July the 15th, 1997, on this issue. Thank you very much. See you then. Emory. Thank you. Third and last item on the agenda this evening is Elizabeth Heights site plan amendment. A request by First Atlantic Corporation for amendment of a previously approved site plan for a 60-unit congregate facility located on Scott Dyer Road, 
Section 19-2-9, Site Plan Review, and Section 19-3-15, Housing for the Elderly under the 1990 Zoning Ordinance. Madam Chair? Yes, Mr. Chairman. As I just closed at the uh, workshop meeting, uh, First Atlantic uh, Corporation is a, is a client of land use consultants, uh, and therefore I recuse myself. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll miss you. I, I will sit in my now. Good. 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 All right. We still have uh, five members of the board, so we do have a quorum this evening. Yeah, no, <coughs> All right. Would a representative of the applicant like to proceed? And yes. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chairperson, members of the board, my name is uh, Craig Coffin. I'm here on behalf of First Atlantic Corporation for a site plan amendment to the Cape Elizabeth Heights Retirement Community. Elizabeth Heights is located on 32 acres of land located on Scarthire Road. The site plan was approved by the Planning Board in January of 1991. The reason we are here tonight for a site plan amendment is because the building has been reduced from 86,671 square feet to 45,141 square feet. In the previous approved plan, the structure was four floors. The new floor plan now has three floors. The building has been decreased in length, width, and height. However, there are still 60 units. The only changes are the type of mix. There are now 36 studios, 10 one bedrooms, 14 two bedrooms. The previous plan could accommodate 102 residents. The new plan can house only 74 residents, a reduction of 28 re residents. The previous plan had a covered parking area area which has been removed from the new site plan because we have found that the majority of this population tends not to drive nor have motor vehicles. Furthermore, we feel the removal of the parking garage lessens the visual impact. Garwin Associates has been retained to design the lighting and landscaping plan around the previously covered parking area. There have not been any changes to the 1991 approved site plan except in the area where the building has been condensed and the emission of the covered parking area. I'd like to stress that this type of housing has a very low impact on the school systems, the police department, the fire department, and traffic. This is a very attractive project, which I feel the town of Cape Lizard will be very proud to have in their community. There is one abutter, Richard Hamlin, located on Russet Lane, one Russet Lane, who has sent a letter to your board concerning the location of the driveway. I've spoken in length to, with Mr. Hamlin, and he is now satisfied with the location of the driveway after reviewing the site plan with Marino Mayor. We ended our conversation with his support for the project. First Atlantic Corporation has a purchase and sales contract to sell the Elizabeth Heights project to Care Matrix when, when we obtain the approvals for the revised site plan. Care Matrix is also a co applicant in securing the approvals. With me tonight is Scott Cohen of Care Matrix to answer any questions you may have. Also, here tonight is the architect of the project, Ken Hagen, to answer any questions, as well as Chris Vaniotis from Bernstein Shore, Soria, and Nelson. What I'd like to do now is hand uh, the podium over to uh, Ken Hagen, the architect, for him to uh, review the um, revised uh, facade and site plan uh, changes. Thank you, Mr. Coffin. Madam Chairperson, members of the board, my Mr. name Hagen, is. Could you put that out a little bit further so sure. perhaps uh, more of us can see it? Yes, that is better. Thank you. My name is Ken Hagen. I'm with the architectural firm of John Shesky and Associates. We're located in Quincy, Massachusetts. Uh, I'd like to offer a brief description of the project. I'll try not to go over some of the things we discussed at our other meeting. Um, we have made some changes based on that meeting, but the basic concept is still the same. Uh, as Craig said, it's a three-story structure with 60 units. Um, the lighter green shaded area 
indicates the footprint of the previous proposal. And that's the roof plan of the current proposal. Um, it's a, a reduction of approximately 9,000 square feet. And you can see it's been pulled in pretty much all the way around the perimeter. But most dramatically on this end, which offers a wider view of the marsh as you approach the building. It also presents a, a smaller elevation on that entry side as you come up the roadway. The other major change, as Craig mentioned, was the re re removal of the parking structure, which was in this location. Um, <clears throat> when we last met, there was some discussion about the landscaping in that regard. And what we've, uh, what we've talked about doing, and this plan shows it, is to provide in that location three <coughs> red oaks on the strip between the two paved areas, which is the same as the planting on the other strip over here. That would allow people exiting their cars to walk up to the building, crossing that landscaped area. The only um, species that were removed on this plan were 13 rose shrubs and 14 hydrangeas, which were basically landscaping along the face of the wall on the parking shed. They were like foundation plantings. Um, that's certainly open for discussion. As Craig said, we have landscape architects from the previous proponents who are part of this team now. The other issue was lighting. And what we would propose is to provide either two or three 20-foot light poles with the same fixtures that were previously shown in the other areas of the, lands of the parking lot. Um, it was a designation type C on the previous proposal. It's a McGraw-Edison fixture. Um, the exact locations would be determined by engineering calculations for foot candle levels. Everything else about the site plan is the same as the previous proposal. Utilities would be in the same locations. Um, <clears throat> topography, drainage, all of that would be just as it was before. We don't need to spend too much time looking at the floor plans, but we have made some changes in that regard, too. Part of it was as a result of trying to revise the roof plan, so we've moved some of the units around. But basically, um, all the core elements, the service elements, are on the ground level. We've moved the wellness center down to the ground floor. That basically is a doctor's office and some exercise equipment, some health facilities for the residents. Um, the kitchen and, and uh, dining are down there. The laundry and, and storage areas are down there. The first level is still the entry with the half level entry here so that we preserve the topography that was on the previous proposal. And as you go up through the building, this core area is where all the common spaces are. Community rooms, function rooms, and so forth. The unit mix is the same as it was before. What we've done with the elevations is, as a result of some of your comments, the last time was try to enrich them by providing more roof shapes and some more trim details. Uh, what we had before, just to orient you, this, this is the front elevation. If you put these two together, that's the entry right in the center of this elevation. And this is the long wing, which goes off at an angle. Looking at this and this on this sheet. The other two on the top are the ends of the building. What we've done uh, is added more of these dormers. Um, <clears throat> the siding materials are the same as discussed before. This is wood clapboards up to this level and wood shingles above that. Asphalt shingles on the roof. Um, we've added some trim details on the gables. We've got some louvers that you can see on, on various locations, and also some panels on these projecting elements, just to break up what is, uh, this is the longest elevation on the building. These are the two back elevations. And they're treated the same way, same materials, same kind of detailing. 
in the corner we have um, a, a deck on the second floor which is open to the community space. We've retained the columns and the porches that were shown before. Uh, you know, this partially is just a further development of the ideas we were showing before. And with that, I guess I'd just ask uh, for any questions that you have. I'd be happy to try to answer them. Do we need to wait for you? Okay. Mr. Aswin. Uh, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, Mr. Hagan, I don't know if this is correct to address this to you, but um, this project has is 60 units equivalent to 60 beds. It isn't, is it? No. Uh, what I'm looking at is in, in the care matrix uh, a package that, uh, that we got that shows all of the projects that are under construction. Talks about beds, units, and I was trying to compare compare the numbers in here with the numbers in all of these other projects. How do I do that? There are 14 two-bedroom units, so I think the number you mentioned was 74. Is that yes. Correct? So we have we have that's. Does that mean 74 beds? 74 beds. There's the potential oh. of 74. Uh, okay. A number of those two bedrooms in, uh, in, in our history of all the those tend not to always be filled with two occupants. Well, what, one of the, uh, and this, this was in your background material, one of the reasons the town was, was interested in having this project um, uh, by, by virtue of the nature of the facility and the type of facility and the company, et cetera. And I look at all these projects, and there are a lot. And this is the smallest one. And these are all projects that are currently uh, under construction or completed in the last year. And I guess my question is, or concern, would be you've downscaled this, this project. Uh, does that mean the quality of what you're bringing into Cape Elizabeth is downgraded? And would you speak specifically to the size versus all these other projects? Sure. Uh, in, no, in no way is it uh, a lesser quality uh, project. It's more in keeping with uh, where the industry is going. Um, we have a similar project in uh, Falmouth, for example, uh, that's 28 units with similar sized uh, units as proposed here um, in Cape Elizabeth. Um, in no way is it a lesser quality. It has the same amenities. It has the same programs. It's just that it's meeting more of the need of what the, you know, the tenant, the client, the, you know, the resident is looking for. So, so this is, uh, uh, this is what, mar this is market driven? Yes. So, I mean, it's a better market in Connecticut and sure. North Carolina and Massachusetts right. by virtue of population? Yes, it is market driven, yes. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from board members? What is the board's pleasure with respect to a public hearing? First of all, has there been any expression of interest uh, to the town planner by any abutters with the public hearing? I have received a call or two asking about the status of the project. Um, no one has explicitly said they wanted a public hearing, uh, except for Mr. Hamlin. Let me correct that. And I have spoken with Mr. Hamlin. He did say he was a lot happier now that he's learned that the driveway for this project is 130 feet away from the entrance to Russet Lane. He was concerned that uh, the sight distance across from Russet Lane was inadequate. He told me he went out there, measured 130 feet down, and was impressed with the amount of sight distance that is actually available. So I don't believe he has any real concerns at this point. I guess my major concern would be the, the facade itself and how different it still is from the um, facade that was approved before, but I don't know whether there are any, uh, I, don't, I guess I don't know whether the uh, residents have had a chance to respond to the materials enough to know whether they would have concerns or not. Um, anybody else have a thought about public hearing versus no public hearing? 
we're not required to have one in this case, but uh, certainly could if the board thought it was a good idea. Madam Chair, seeing that there has been little, if any, public request, I see no need for a public hearing. Mr. Cross. I just have one question, again, based on over, over the years, when the board has <clears throat> this size of project before them, is it a, there an assumption out there in the, by the population or by the residents of the Cape that there will be automatically a public hearing? Is that a, something that history can tell us at all? I, based on what I hear from, from the board, I don't see the need of a public hearing either at this point. But I'm just wondering, because of the size of it, does it make sense to still have one? It is a large piece of property. It's a large tax base to the town. And there might be very well some comments out there just waiting for the public meeting. So I guess I'm going to say, no, I think I would like to have a public meeting after I've been listening to myself here. <laughs> well, <that's coughs> I talked myself into that one. Part of, uh, I, so I, I would, favor a public hearing. I would certainly agree with you. I think a project of this size, I would feel somewhat uncomfortable with uh, just dealing with it substantively without giving the public the opportunity to come forward. If, if we don't have any people who come forward, then at least we can certainly say that we've provided the opportunity. That's correct. I, I, I think it's a good point. I hadn't thought of it. But a project of this size to just um, be considered without that opportunity might not be prudent. I would agree with you both. And it looks like we uh, okay. will be noticing a public hearing for the next uh, time, if I'm not mistaken, although I know we'll, we'll need a, p a particular motion for that. Uh, Ma is Madam Chair? Yes. Could I just add something? On, my I'm, I'm my here tonight, and you didn't Otis? think I was going to remain silent, did you? <laughs> of course I, I guess not. the only thing I would, I, I'm Chris Vaniotis, counsel for First Atlantic, who is the, the current holder of the permit. Uh, the only thing I would ask the board to consider is that what you're really looking at here is, is a reduction in size of what is a large project, but has already been approved and gotten considerable public input, of course, back when it was through the process, came back in 94 for uh, an extension of the approval, and has been in front of the town council twice in the past couple of years. Uh, our sense at First Atlantic is that people in the neighborhood are fully aware of what's going on here. I, I believe all the abutters were notified when it came back um, for this requested amendment. And there really hasn't been much expression of public interest. Um, we have no objection to holding a public hearing, but I know the, the folks at Care Matrix are anxious to break ground uh, and get this project rolling as quickly as possible so that construction can be underway um, during the good construction season. So that, that would be our only concern about putting it off again for another month. We understand the board's concerns, but uh, Part of what's happened here, I think, is I think the neighborhood and the public has expected since 1991 that this project is going to be built. Uh, and what is going to be built is the same kind of project, but smaller. And I think that's why you haven't seen much expression of public concern about this proposal to uh, reduce the size of the building. So we just wanted to let you know that if, if the board could see its way clear to uh, uh, not putting us off for another month, that would be most helpful to us. Um, but obviously, that's the board's decision. Madam Thank you, Chair. Mr. Benioz. Madam Chair? Yes. Ms. I have a Powell. question of Maureen, our planner. Were the abutters notified of the workshop meeting? Yes. Thank and you. And there was, Mr. Hamlin did attend the workshop. And then there was another notice sent for tonight's meeting. Um, the only thing you should realize is that when people call me and ask me if they can speak, I tell them that there's not a public hearing scheduled, so they're probably not going to be allowed to speak. And, you know, people might have gotten into the groove of understanding that they have to wait for the public hearing notice. I'm not guaranteeing anyone will show up for the public hearing. I've heard you on the telephone, though, and you always tell them they can write the board at any time. Absolutely. And we always do at workshops. <clears throat> Madam Chair always does. And again, I, I haven't seen any input. That's why I feel the way I do. That you're willing to go ahead without a public hearing? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Mr. Wilcox, do you want to say anything further? Um, I, I have a 
question in terms of the public noticing. Has it specifically said that there have been changes made to the, uh, I mean, beyond just the size of the building to the, uh, to the design of the building? Let me get back <laughs> notes out for you. The notice mailed on June 6, 1997 uh, said at a meeting on Tuesday, June 17, 1997, beginning at 7 p.m. in the Town Hall Council Chambers, the Town of Cape Elizabeth Planning Board will begin to review a request by First Atlanta Corporation for amendment of a previously approved site plan of a 60-unit congregate care facility located on Scott Dyer Road. For more information or review the plans, please contact the Town Planner at 799-0115. And a map was attached. Has anyone called to review, quote, review the plans? Mr. Hamlin. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, a public hearing is really necessary. There are issues regarding the, uh, regarding the design of the building, which I think are different from the way the original proposal uh, was rendered. Uh, in terms of its scale and and appearance, uh, I'm not sure they are substantive, substantively addressed in our ordinance. Uh, so therefore, I think uh, the public hearing is something that I guess would be optional at this point. I, I certainly agree that, that, that the public hearing would be optional. Um, not coming down too strong on that one, Jim. <laughs> 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 Any further comment, Mr. Carlson? I respect the applicant, the council, uh, the comments there. Um, the only thing is the population has changed. It's increased. There are different people around. There are different people, I suppose, active. And I guess somewhat of a selfish reason, I as a board member would feel much more comfortable of a project of this size and of such magnetism in our town. I mean, this, this isn't a house that's being built or a two, two uh, apartments or something like that. It's a it's a big project, and I would, as a member of the board, would feel much more comfortable at public hearing. Thank you. Any further comments? I guess I would just like to say that um, we are we are not faced here with a an amendment to the project, which is correct in every, I mean, is exactly the same in every detail except just a slightly smaller footprint. We really do have visual issues and visual impact, and we really did require elevations the last time and, uh, you know, looking at the project from a distance, what do you see, that, that sort of thing from various stages. And I guess I really would like to, to have the neighbors have an opportunity to comment on that. Um, and I suppose the beginning of the reviewing of an amendment would make me, if I were a neighbor, possibly surprised if everything went tonight mm -hmm. one way or the other. So those are my reasons for saying that, with all due respect to Mr. Vaniotis's position, that I would, I would recommend that we have a public hearing. But the way to proceed, I think it makes sense to me, is to uh, ask for any further discussions, or if, if not a further discussion, a motion of some kind, and we can see what the board's brothers are on this. Madam Chair, yes, I'll, Mr. Wilcox. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll clarify myself a little bit more. I, I would feel more comfortable if the changes in the design were more known by the general public prior to approval, I think. And if this is a way to get that done, I would support it. And it seems it's the only way to get I, it. I think it's the only way that I know of. Any further comment from the applicant? Uh, if not, do I hear a motion? Madam Chair? Yes, Mr. Carlson. <clears throat> Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application to First Atlantic Corporation for amendments to the previously approved site plan for Elizabeth Heights, a 60-unit congregate care project located on Scott Dyer Road, R5-2, be tabled to the July 15, 1997 meeting of the Planning Board, at which time a public hearing shall be held. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second the motion, Mr. Aslino. 
Any uh, further discussion of the motion itself? Um, I have one question of the planning board, and I meant to ask this before I ask for the motion. Is there any further information that you would like to have from the applicant? Is there anything that the materials before you do not address or do not cover? We need to make that plain uh, tonight if there is any concern in that direction. Mr. Wilcox? Uh, yes, I have a couple of questions for the applicant. These may already be in progress for, for all I know. Uh, in terms of uh, review of the project under, uh, under the local code enforcement office, have, uh, have requirements from the code enforcement office been clarified for you at this point? And is this a, a residential project uh, which uh, is autom or is, is this a non-residential project which automatically requires review by the Office of the State Fire Marshal or has it been determined to be uh, a residential project which does not? Or is the town going one way or another? It, uh, it will require review by the State Fire Marshal's Office. The, the approved building, the one for which a building permit was issued in 1996, did indeed have a State Fire Marshal permit. So the occupancy, occupancy is such that it will require mm -hmm. state fire marshal approval. And in fact, in state statute, and I'm sorry I can't cite you chapter and verse, I think I left that portion of my file back at the office, but in state statute there's a specific requirement for congregate care facilities uh, that they be reviewed under certain portions of the life safety code, and that is a state fire marshal determination. Okay. And that, that really comes at the building permit stage. Before we can get the building permit, before the code officer will issue it, you will want to see the um, approval by the state fire marshal. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. And I have one, yes. one further Mr. question. Mr. Um, will there be a locally affiliated uh, architectural design firm for this project with uh, registration in the state of Maine? We do have registration in the state of Maine. John Shesky, the principal in my firm, has a, a Maine state license. Oh. Okay. We also are associated with Gower and Associates on the landscape and the site work. Okay. Thank you. Any further comments uh, from any board members about uh, further information to fill out the application? Okay, hearing none, there is a motion that's on the table to, um, it's been moved and seconded that the application be tabled to the July meeting, at which time a public hearing is held. Further discussion on that motion? If not, all in favor, raise your right hand. All opposed? Four to one. We'll see you at the July meeting, and thank you very much. Anything further to come before the planning board? If not, do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair.